Welcome everybody, this is Melissa Rogozinski and you're watching the Rising Phoenix interview series. This is where leaders of legal tech come together to discuss best practices for strategy, growth, and success. Today, I am delighted to have my friend and colleague, Stephanie Wilkins, Editor-in-Chief of Legal Tech News, as our guest. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so, Stephanie, tell every you and I have already talked. I know a little bit about your background, and when you, you know, got the role, what I guess a little over a year, year and a half ago, I reached out and was so excited to see you um, in that position. But tell everybody a little bit about your background and um, how you got here uh, to editor in chief role. Sure. I, it was actually only 10 months ago and it feels so much longer. Everybody, I, I keep joking. It's like seven in AI years because everyone feels like I've been around forever in a good way. Um, my path wasn't necessarily direct. I was a lawyer by training. I went to law school. I went to NYU. I practiced as a litigator in big firms in New York for about eight years. I loved writing always since even before law school. I got burned out on the profession. It's not it's not a unique story. So many lawyers get burned out, just so many hours on work that didn't motivate me. And I left. I left to the at the point where, you know, if I was going to go on and make partner, it would have been the rest of my life. There was no getting out of it soon. So I sort of took the leap and did it. Knew I always liked writing. I if you had asked me in 2010 if I was ever going to do anything in the legal industry again, I would have said absolutely not. I thought I was that burned out on it. But I still had a lot of contacts. So as I was making a freelance career, half of what I doing was doing was with legal contacts. I was always somewhat tech savvy. I didn't really realize it because you don't necessarily, it, it's not hard to be the most tech savvy person in a law firm, at least back in the aughts, it definitely was not. So I just sort of fell into over a decade ago, writing about legal technology. And then, you know, I, my other career was photography. And as the pandemic happened, those in-person jobs were not happening. So I doubled down on the legal tech writing. And this job opened up right when I was looking to shake things up. So it's been a perfect fit so far. And it's I'm actually really thankful that I've kept my a lot of my contacts in this space because, you know, they, it comes in handy. They've all gone on to different companies. There's, there's so many people that I've re-met up with 20 years later, you know, who are now in this same world. And it's a really fascinating little space we're in. Well, I mean, and, and that's what I experienced with you too. It just was so easy and so natural to get to know you. And when we see each other conferences, like I've been a little, I, I was starstruck, quite frankly. And you're like, oh, girl, girl, how are you? You know, and it's just, like, and yeah. then we sit down and we just talk like girlfriends. And it's just, it's been so nice to have you um, in that role and in this space. So, um, so for our audience, Stephanie and I are going to discuss the current impact of AI on legal tech and legal marketing. Uh, it seems to be, almost the only topic that anybody's talking about right now. Um, so Stephanie, I think of all of the influencers that I follow, definitely is at the top of the list for having probably in the top five that has the deepest knowledge base of AI. So uh, we're going to dive right in. Oh yeah, you're welcome. All right. So um, this is a mix of legal tech articles and one or two of maybe RPCs, but so the first article I want to talk about is tracking generative AI, how evolving AI models are impacting legal. And um, all of these links will be included in the description in the video. So you can go look. And this seems to be a running list of current AI articles uh, that Legal Tech is publishing. So, uh, you know, we've been hearing in the news in the grapevine that venture capital has been drying up and um, currently very difficult to obtain. But some companies are finding funding. So Stephanie, talk to us. What are they doing differently? Why are they able to get funding when others can't? All right. I mean, I'd like to note first that I'm not, you know, I'm not a VC expert. I'm not a P <laughs> private equity expert. Um, I can just speak to the tr trends we've been seeing and what we hear in the market. And for sure, there is a lot of talk about funding drying up, but where we are seeing it going, maybe not exclusively, but very largely is to companies that are incorporating generative AI. Um, and whether or not it remains to be seen if that will pan out and be the trend in the long run or if people are just sort of excited about the buzz in it. But there, in, there is definitely a buzz. Um, some would say there's a buzz as much as to be a bubble. Um, but it, it's interesting. Some, 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 people, some people will say it's not AI that's driving it, but data is interesting. You can always parse it to support whatever you want. And 
So when you lump in technologies that are more general enterprise technology used by legal organizations, that definitely skews the numbers. But when we look at it, we're looking at true legal tech companies who exist mostly or entirely to support legal industry. Sometimes I'll also do financial, but it's very niche technology. And a lot of what we are seeing, especially in the last quarter or so, are these generative AI companies that are getting the fundings. Any idea about the what the what's the range of funding you've been seeing? Um, it, it, and I'm just talking about the last quarter. I mean, we've seen several in the, you know, 10 to 20 million, but then there have been a few outliers, like even up it's a, uh, it's a personal injury legal tech product that a lot of people hadn't even heard of. And they raised a 50.5 million series B funding. And then there was this French company, Mistral AI. No, they don't even have a product yet. They're just an AI company, so they may not be legal. They didn't even have a product yet, and they raised $113 million in seed funding. And then I was talking to Wayne Chang from Patented AI. He's a serial tech entrepreneur who's done a lot of, a lot of things over the years. Um, and he created a product called LLM Shield. Okay. And he, he they got a $4 million pre-seed funding, which for pre-seed, that's an insanely high amount. So, it, I mean, it could be a bubble. It who knows, but they're definitely, the people who are moving are interested in the generative AI space. I don't know what you have to sort of prove to jump the hurdle to show that you are the one that deserves the money, but the interest is definitely there. And we keep seeing rumblings to that effect that legal tech and AI are hot right now to the extent anything is, because yes, we are in sort of a down cycle. Yeah, we, uh, and I mentioned this to you earlier, we discussed that with Mike Bryant, a uh, partner at Knox Capital, in our um, interview with him a couple months ago when talking about legal tech investing. And so uh, between Stephanie and Mike, anybody watching this video, uh, you should be able to get all the information you need to pitch successfully. So, um, okay, so let's move on. So the next article we want to talk about is generative AI is bringing waves of funding to the legal tech. So we're still kind of in the same space. Um, leveraging generative AI and legal tech is clearly getting the attention of seasoned um, industry investors, as well as those who have overlooked the niche. And that's a big one. We're seeing people who have never been in legal tech are really taking a hard look and seeing this as uh, an industry that is lucrative and can really deliver on ROI. So um, are, all, are investors all in on legal tech that integrates AI, or are they interested in other tech companies that maybe AI isn't necessarily the focus. I think, I mean, I think any savvy investor will always be interested in anything and will take a deeper look, but AI definitely opens doors. I mean, it definitely gets people to look in the first place. It may not get you over the finish line, but it is, it is the hot technology right now. And, and for reason, because the potential is great and people who are using it correctly are doing great things with it. I think the thing to be a to be cautious about, not just in the investing space with anyone using the tools space also, is that a lot of uh, products or companies will just start slapping the term AI on there or generative AI. And you have to ask, is it really? Uh, so there needs to be, you know, you take everything with a grain of salt, but it is definitely opening doors and it is definitely um, bringing in attention. We've been seeing like more and more law firms involved in funding rounds too for some of these tools, which I mean, it's not that that's never happened before, but the names pop up. Or I think it was probably about a year or so ago that Clio, the legal tech company, started his own Clio Ventures. Right, I saw where that. They, where they invest, and they've been investing a couple of these tools. And I'm so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go out there and say it's strictly generative AI. I mean, people are still considering any, anything. I mean, there are some C, um, CLM companies that are still getting funding, or you know, I manage got an undisclosed amount, things like that. Even though they're starting to incorporate AI, they're not just they're broader. Mm -hmm. So. It, it'll play out because, I mean, we talked about like when I, I joked about it being, you know, seven in AI years since I started this job, we all feel like generative AI has been around forever, mm -hmm. but it's only like we, I mean, it has been around for a little while, but it's only been on the public radar since ChatGPT came out in late November last year, which is not that long. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a lot of activity in a very short period of time, even though it's moving so fast, it feels like a long period of time. So we can talk about what we've seen. That's why I've been focusing on the last quarter, but it's really just only a quarter. It's, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Well, and I think also worthy of being mentioned is what Raymond Blidge of Legal Complex has also been contributing to the articles and interviews with you guys that um, 
AI, yes, it is this big focus, but it's also very expensive to implement. And it's more the hardware, not the software that, you know, where's the ROI? What is the impact to the total addressable market? Um, you know, and companies that are really considering who the target audience is, what their goals are, what are the pain points and the obstacles standing in the way, and how is integrating AI into your solution going to help them effectively and efficiently reach their goals? You know, all of these things need to be considered as well. It's like you said earlier, you can't just slap the AI term on it and expect to get attention. Like you actually have to deliver value, but when it's so expensive to implement at first, like you really have to think this through and consider that. Mm -hmm. Cost is a huge barrier right now across the board with generative AI. I mean, these tools are expensive to implement because they're, these models are incredibly expensive to build and train. I mean, the GPUs are in short supply. They cost in the, you know, like 30, I think now the most updated one is something like $30,000 a chip. I mean, it's, and they need hundreds of them for the size of these companies that are. So they are investing a ton of money to train the models. Then in turn, it's expensive to get the products and expensive to implement them. Ideally, everyone is hoping that will go down, like with any technology, like your first flat screen TV costs like $3,000 and they don't cost that now. But it, so it is expensive. So people, that's why you're going to see a lot of big firms moving on it faster because they have the resources. But right now it is hard it is hard to make the decisions and it, this technology to me is no different than what i've said about every technology in law ever is that technology for the sake of technology is not something i support ai for the sake of ai should not be your goal any technology whether or not it's ai whether it's generative ai you should be thinking about why you are implementing it what are you trying to solve with it what are you expecting to get out of it and yes a lot of times people are where they see they view it as an expense Whereas down the road, the, the expense pays off. So it will be an initial investment. And that is fine because the big picture is what's more important. But there really needs to be a lot of thoughtful consideration of how you're doing this. And I think maybe that price tag will prevent some people from just slapping in a tool that they didn't think about properly that they needed or not. So there's just a lot of thought that needs to be going in. It's, it's tempting to just jump on the bandwagon. And that's just that's not the right approach because... Yeah, you want to tell your clients we're using AI, but then as soon as they ask, well, what are you using and why? You need well, to be able to why? answer that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the that's the other thing that you are seeing people talk about is okay, what's the strategy to deliver the ROI now? How are you going to generate revenue as a result of this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's harder to get at right now. I mean, because we've done a lot of coverage, obviously, of the the companies, the tech companies that are producing these products, because you know they're very open, they want it out there. When it comes to strategies at firms or in-house implementing these tools, people are still working it out. A lot of times they don't necessarily want to give away their secret sauce because it's, it's going to be a competitive differentiator right now too. And if they are in sort of a testing or sandbox environment, there's no incentive to say what it is until they've you implemented it and have results to show. So, I mean, there's a lot of strategy going on in not such public places. We'll see more of it in the next couple of months and by the end of the year, I'd say for sure. But, you know, strategy is a huge component. And anyone who is serious about this is like is really, really thinking hard about it and having a lot of meetings and a lot of thought of how to use it, how to deploy it, when. Because the answer won't be the same for everybody. There's no one size fits all to any of this. So that kind of is a nice segue into the next article, uh, which just came out this week. And I am so excited to see this. Harvard launched a new initiative to better understand and shape the future of AI. So, um, and a I mean, as we know, like AI has actually been around legal for a long time. Like, you know, TAR, predictive coding. When I was in sales and e-discovery, we were taught to start selling predictive coding by comparing it to how you create a station on Pandora, right? You just enter an artist or a song and it creates a whole station for you. Like that's AI. So like, it's, it's not new. It's just got a lot more marketing gumption behind it and a new message and a new use, right? So anyway, let, so Harvard recently launched this new initiative to better understand how it's going to shape law. What are some of the issues that Harvard's new program is trying to address? Well, for a long time, there's been a lag in, in technology knowledge and education in the legal industry as a whole. And that's because they don't teach it in law school. They're starting to more and I mean, slowly but surely, you're getting law schools teaching more tech-centric courses. But I know when I went, 
there were none. And mm-hmm. I mean, that wasn't yesterday, but it wasn't, you know, 50 years ago either. But so we've needed to fill this gap for a long time. And I think you made a really important point that AI is not new. It's just this generative AI, this class of AI that has really garnered all the attention. And people tend to forget that AI has been around since, you know, the 50s or 60s. And it's been in law, in successful products, in e-discovery, in legal research tools for a long time. Just this is, these are more powerful models. They do newer things. And so the need to know it and know how to use it has been there for a long time. But the legal in, legal industry has, for a long time, had a reputation for being tech averse. And it sort of pans out. You know, I, I quit big law in 2010 and I started this job in 2022. And a lot hadn't changed. Certainly some things had. I'm not saying nothing had changed. But, you know, there was still this huge tech aversion. And that was before generative AI splashed on the scene. And now everyone's really excited about it because finally they realized this is bigger than, this is bigger than legal. It's not like e-discovery, which is very specifically legal tech. AI is not legal tech. It's just tech that's taking over the world, working its way into legal. So I guess there's a, I mean, I, I assume that's what sort of made this uptick in interest. And so the law schools are starting to catch up. I love seeing this initiative by Harvard Law School. I'm not at all surprised that it's in conjunction with their Center on Internet and Society, because I think law schools that successfully start teaching these things are going to have some sort of collaboration with other schools going on because, and to their, I mean, not to their fault, law professors aren't trained as technology teachers, you know, and most of the law school faculty isn't either because, I mean, they went through law school and they weren't taught it. Um, So these sort of joint programs, I'm so excited to see. I know, I mean, there's there's courses that Cornell Tech has a few courses that in conjunction with Cornell Law School that are interesting. I know like Northwestern Law School has done some initiatives along with their one of their science schools. I don't remember which one. Engineer, I believe it was engineering school. But that's exactly what I mean, where it's going to be these, these joint thing, these joint uh, divisions coming together because people are recognizing that law is changing. And going forward, being a lawyer, being a lawyer now doesn't look like what it did 30 years ago. Like people didn't even know how to run businesses when they were lawyers before. That's another skill. It's not just technology. The necessary skills for law have changed so drastically and what lawyers have to do and technology is a huge one. So I just, I can't wait to see more initiatives like this. And also I would love to see it at law firms too. I've heard, I've heard of certain law firms starting to institute training programs for their associates. It's education is key to all of this. It's a key to getting over the fear of it. It's getting, it's key to knowing how to use it, getting the most out of it. And I mean, this is just a great first step. I'm very excited to see it. Yeah. And, and, and this kind of what they're doing addresses the question, the fear that everybody's had is, is this going to replace my job? Um, Not necessarily. It's a tool for all of us. And like for legal services, how can legal services be optimized using AI? Because guess what? Your clients are going to expect you to use these kinds of technologies. And how do we address obviously data privacy issues, discrimination, you know, the hallucinations, misinformation, like ChatGPT has been sued in lawsuits on all of those things. So, you know, again, I'm with you to see what Harvard and other law schools are going to do um, to really start putting some framework and guidelines around optimizing legal services and, you know, managing, you know, the other concerns of data privacy and all that. You know, same thing when I was doing the round table, um, I was constantly invited to paralegal schools and to law schools to speak as a guest speaker or be on a panel, I was flown to different places and, um, or I've had law schools that partnered with me to bring the round table programs because that was the only technology training they had. And that was only 10 years ago. Um, so it's, it's exciting to finally see these kinds of tech courses in the law schools. So, um, okay. So let's move into marketing. Uh, So my world (laughs) um, and part of the reason we met. So let's understanding the limitations of AI and marketing for legal tech. So it's an article that I wrote. Steve Salkin actually echoed some of the things you've already said. um, And he also had an opportunity to address this for law firms. um, And he got really passionate about websites, um, law firm websites. So uh, let's, what are some of the pros that you have seen or heard about on how AI can be used in marketing? Then we'll address the cons, but what are some of the pros? 
Sure. And I would say in this, like your world is not that different than my world, even though I'm not, you are marketing and I'm journalism and we're dealing with these same sort of things because you're dealing with a tool that creates content very quickly and very easily. And, and it's very, very tempting to do it. And there are pros to it. You know, it's fast. It, right. It's creative. It, I mean, you, it can generate something just in a, no matter how good of a writer you are, how fast of a writer you are, it can generate things in a fraction of the time, access resources, it can create copy for you. And when you are working in a field that you just have to generate content all day, every day, you know, marketing, it's, it can seem, I mean, it can, it's great. It can be a great assistant. It can get you to places where you're not, you know, working all night and working all weekend. You can brainstorm headlines with it. You can, all, all, like it, it's great. I mean, that's this entire thing. It's based on language. It can, generates language. If you're in a language-based profession, it can be a great boon to you in efficiency and creativity. Sometimes even if you're not using what it produces, it can spur ideas for you. It can be, you know, it, it's a creativity job. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of potential uses for marketing in particular because it it, it, could, it could train on all different marketing. You can see, you can show it, these things have been successful before, these haven't, do this route, or you can experiment with it more. It gives you more time to experiment with different styles. Yeah, I've experienced since it came out and clients started asking us about it. I started practicing on, I, I will always do this. I will always practice on RPC first before I even think about, you know, offering it to a client or creating something for a client with it. But I started with when we did our 2023 social media calendar and we put it out and we're running a little bit late, but we put it out in February. And I had that was the first time I used it was having it create um, some email fodder for me to send out in my nurturing campaign to send this out to my database. And I had to do it three times. And then I still had to massage it, you know, for my voice. Right. And then the next time, another time I used it, uh, was to write an article, um, every anniversary of RPC, my team asked me to write a letter to our audience. And so this year I wrote a letter about having a seat at the table and what that really means. Cause there's been you know, a lot of conversation about that, a lot of um, push on DE and I, um, and we've seen a lot of very positive things happen along that. And so it was just a good time to write that article. But like you, like I was just on my way to legal week and I'm meeting with my author to write the book, you know, for my, my personal journey. And I just didn't have time. So I wrote the beginning of it. And then I basically interviewed chat GPT and I asked it like five or six questions, like, how, when, what, why, you know? And so I put that out there and it was really helpful to me when it produced it. And, but I still learned even through there that I had to train it. Like I only give it parameters. I only wanted two paragraphs and I want this, but I also saw it repeat itself too. So still, um, you know, I had to massage it. And then another time I used chat GPT and Bard to run an SEO strategy on a website twice each. And the SEO strategy it ran was completely not that company's specialty. And it had apparently caught on one tagline that the company wasn't even using anymore that made it sound like a different industry or service than what it was and completely ignored existing taglines, completely ignored blog articles, brochures. There was a ton of content on the website and it completely ignored it. So like, I, you know, it's, you have to, know what you want from it. And I was training with another colleague, a CMO colleague today, this morning before you and I met, um, but you have to really know what your parameters are and set those expectations, tell it what you want. You have to really kind of fine tune your prompts in order to get, but you're still going to have to edit it and massage it for you or for the client or whoever it is you're writing for. Right. It's not going to be perfect. It's, but it is a tool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. So let's, that kind of leads us into, let's talk about what are some of the cons of AI and marketing? Yeah, I, I, some of them are what you just said, for sure. These tools are known, especially public tools like ChatGPT. I mean, they're known to hallucinate. I mean, there's there, there's reasons they do it. I mean, that's that they're, they are machines. They are based on math. It's these algorithms. And so you always are going to have to check what it is. So, I mean, you may be getting things faster, but like you said, it may be totally wrong. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very clear con. Um and, you know, you said you might have to like, tweak it, like, you all tweak, tweak your prompts, but it's still, does it really sound like you? Maybe one day it will, but if you are in, a, if you want to have a voice, a distinctive voice, if you want people to know that it's yours and be indistinguishable from anybody else, this might not be the best thing. I mean, they might be using the exact same tool. It'll end up being a lot of 
generically similar. It'll be good content. It'll be well-written content, but very generic. And it won't necessarily have flavor. It won't necessarily make you stand out. So that's why I always say it's a good assistant or a good first draft, because unless you're really pressed for time, you should always be not just checking it for accuracy, but checking for it to see if that's what you want to go out under your name or under your company's name. Um, there's a lot of places out there that if they're just strictly SEO farms and they're not actually, they're just cranking out content and they don't care how generic it is. Yeah, that would work. But I feel like a lot of marketing, especially, you know, in a down economy, the personal touch plays a big role in it. And you're not going to get that personal touch from ChatGPT or like these tools. It'll take you a long time to finesse it to actually sound like Stephanie Wilkins. I think that's a good point that you brought up too, is um, the difference between what you call SEO farms and, you know, it's been referenced before in other conversations, um, but yes, it's a tool, but you have to look at it. You have to verify it. You have to fact check. And especially depending on who you are, your company, who your target audience is, um, it, you, you really do still need to consider having the human touch to it and having a strategic consultant who understands that space um, to make sure that it's right. If it's going out under your name, that's developing your brand and your reputation. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, and there may be portions you can use it for. Like I'd say, for, say, for example, you sent out a newsletter that had one little segment of it that was purely just, you know, something like one sentence summaries of things. That section might be fine because that's just a very generic section. But again, yeah, I definitely agree that the originality and showing your expertise, you need to add that human touch to it. Yeah, especially when you're in a niche industry, legal tech, e-discovery, you know, data privacy, you know, in any anybody else outside of legal tech, if you're in a very niche industry, um, you can't put things out uh, and expect to have brand and reputation if you don't have your own touch on it. So, um, right. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, we're all in a down cycle right now. The economy, we've been, they've been predicting this for a while that we would either hit a recession or we would hit almost a recession. But either way, analysts have predicted it would be short-lived and it appears that we are in that space now. Um, so let's talk about that. How can companies continue to grow their businesses in a recession? I mean, I would say focus on value, figure out what your value proposition is. What is it that you really are trying to deliver and then build everything around that. Don't be distracted by bells and whistles, which a lot of AI can be. Focus on what you're trying to do and then fit AI into that. Like I said before, not tech for the sake of tech, not AI for the sake of AI, not anything just for the sake of anything. You should always, you started your business or somebody started your business if you didn't start it yourself for a purpose. And you need to always be driving to that purpose, even if you're expanding to new goals. The, the issue at hand and what you're trying to do should be dictating everything because there's not money to spare and there's not resources to spare. So, I mean, unfortunately, there might be a little less experimentation going on because it's a little bit more expensive, but try to maximize the tools you already have. I mean, I, I'm speaking from a tech lens because that's what I write about all day. You know, try to maximize the tools you have, or if if they're completely the wrong tools, I know people feel like it's a sum cost, but if you're never going to get the right thing out of them, sometimes you just have to make the switch and you just have to try to differentiate yourself as much as you can using what you have on hand. Like I hate the do more with less because it's such a hackneyed phrase at this point. And what does that really mean? And it's just it's just do more with what you have or do more with new things, do more, try to get more out of the what you have and what you're not, don't think of it as less, think about maximizing what you have. I, I love that. And, and that's the thing too, like if sales are, you know, when you're in a down cycle, sales are often a little difficult, but you can't stop putting out marketing messaging. You can't stop communicating you, it. Cause that's, and I'm not, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much. Like, but there's certain areas where businesses try to do more with less, cut costs, things like that. But whatever you're doing, make sure you're continuing to communicate however that is. Continue to communicate personally as a professional and as a business to your audience 
and let them know what your movements are. Let them know what your progress is. And I mean, you should be doing that anyway, even when we're in an up cycle, right? And things are great and flush. So just don't stop communicating. Right. And when it comes to cutting costs, I know it's really difficult, but try as much as you can to be forward looking, to think longer term and bigger picture, because there's a lot of things that it might be tempting to say, oh, we could save all this money right now by just cutting this. But will you want it again down the road? Because that might be a very short term fix that gets you through a month, but then puts you way farther behind when once you get through whether or not we're hitting a full recession or what we are. So, I mean, don't the short term feels very pressing. And I understand that I'm very sympathetic to that. But as a business that to succeed, you need to always be thinking long term as much as you can. Agreed. Agreed. Um, all right, Stephanie. So we've talked uh, everything AI today. This was an exciting conversation. So we've talked about AI and investing and the companies that are what they're doing right to get investments. Um, you know, we've talked about what the law schools are doing, starting to create more tech classes. Uh, and we've talked about AI's impact on your job and my job, right? Um, and right, we do some of the same things to the same audience, but for different reasons, right? So, um, and then we talked a little bit about just continuing to communicate, like we whether we're in, a, in a recession or not, short term, whatever, you know, continue to communicate um, and let people know that you're still there. So as we wrap up, Stephanie, is there anything else that you would like to add as a recap to our audience? I, mean, I just say on the AI front that, I mean, I know some people are sick of hearing about it. Some people are still scared of it. I mean, it it's here to stay. I'm not saying that in a scary way because I appreciate it. it might be scary, but but it is here. And the best thing to do is to educate yourself on it. And, you know, we talked about briefly, you know, AI taking jobs or changing jobs. And yes, there will be change and change is uncomfortable, but I don't believe it's coming to take your jobs. It might take some of your tasks. I don't know about you, but I have plenty of tasks I would gladly not do every day. When I was a lawyer, I never had enough time to get everything done. It'd be great if some things would have been taken off my plate. So really just understanding it because going forward, it will work its way into most jobs, whether or not you know it consciously. So being comfortable with it will become a differentiating skill. You don't have to be a prompt engineer, but being open to it and being on board is going to be part of the path forward. So you should be on that bus. You don't have to be driving it necessarily, but you should be on that bus because you don't want to be back at the bus stop. I agree. I agree. Well, um, as, a, as a friend and a colleague, it was I'm so excited to have you here on the Phoenix interview series. So um, I want to thank our audience. Yeah, yeah. So I want to thank our audience for joining us. I hope that you have enjoyed the interview with Stephanie Wilkins, editor in chief of Legal Tech News. Again, my name is Melissa Rodzinski with RPC Strategies, home of the dream team. Please connect with RPC Strategies on LinkedIn and register for our newsletter. You can also contact us at RPC at rpcgrowthstrategies.com or 205-873-1234.